Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be looking at the various different sampling methods. So there's eight different sampling methods that you need to know about. Four of them are probability based techniques and four of them are non-probability based techniques. We're going to be talking about each of them in a fairly general sense. Uh, when it comes time to answer questions about them, particularly in the exam, it's very important that as well as knowing the general uh, what each of these are, you can apply them to a scenario. And so for different scenarios, the way that you apply a particular technique may be slightly different. So this is something very important to keep in mind, particularly as you get closer to the exam. So a non-probability sampling technique is pretty much just what it says. It's one which is not, uh, has not been selected through some sort of random method. Um, there is normally some sort of personal judgment on the part of the researcher. So the person who is conducting the sampling is in some way or other picking the people that are in it. One of the big disadvantages of non-probability sampling is that uh, it is more likely to have bias and makes it much more difficult to generalize to the general population. The advantage of the non-probability methods is they tend to be a bit quicker and easier to use. So we might use them more for uh, qualitative, finding qualitative data and for some of our earlier work before we go about a, uh, a more formal and larger sampling uh, in order to collect quantitative data. Probability sampling on the other hand is where we have some sort of random method of selecting our sampling units. Uh, ideally each unit has an equal chance of being selected uh, but this can vary method to method and uh, is something that we can address later on when we're doing analysis. The nice thing with the probability methods is they are less likely to be biased uh, and particularly biased by the selection and they will allow us to make uh, better and hopefully more reliable inferences about our population of interest. So just a quick summary of the non-probability versus probability. Uh, so probability we would consider to be more conclusive, uh, whereas the non-probability is more of an exploratory type of sampling. Uh, there's more potential for bias, um, and in the non-probability, and particularly if we're going to be trying to do any quantitative methods, the statistical considerations uh, tend to favour probability sampling. Um, so, and then when I'm saying operational considerations, I guess that's the cost and effort. It's uh, normally easier to do non-probability sampling than it is to do probability sampling. And it comes down very much to what kind of data we want to collect, um, how reliable it needs to be and what we're going to do with it as to whether what method we choose. Sometimes we may have two elements. We might be looking for uh, interview participants. We might use non-probability sampling to try and pick some um, interview participants and then probability sampling for our uh, more quantitative uh, questionnaire and surveying. So our me first method is convenient sampling. And so convenient sampling is exactly what it sounds like. You're just picking people because they happen to be in the right place and the right time. It's easy. So it's quick and it's easy, but there's a very strong uh, chance of having bias. So really common uh, convenient sampling would be where you see people in shopping centers where they have the little clipboards and they chase after you. Anytime you see questionnaires that are just sitting on uh, on a website and people can uh, answer them or you have your uh, TV uh, text in polls, things like that are all examples of convenient sampling. Um, so basically it's a quick and easy way of getting a sample. Big problem is that it's only going to have a very limited sample frame. You can imagine that if I was for instance, picking people at a shopping centre, 
And I'd highlight that this is shopping center selection is just one example of convenience sampling. It's not the only way of doing it. But if you were picking people at a shopping center, then only people who come to that shopping center on that day have any chance of being selected. And so that's quite a strong uh, bias that will potentially then bias whatever data you collect off those people. So our second method, judgment sampling, still uh, is non-random and is still got a potential for bias. Basically the researcher is using some sort of judgment to pick people. It could be that this is kind of tied in with the convenience sampling. Maybe they're at a shopping mall or they're somewhere convenient, but they're trying to apply a little bit more judgment. So they might um, kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to select this person for this reason. I'm going to select this person for this reason. Um, you won't be able to generalize to populations and there is a chance of bias, but it can be quite useful. I mean, if I was doing a pilot study and I was wanting to test my survey instrument, I would use what would be judgment sampling where I would go and I would intentionally pick particular kinds of people to test my survey out on. So there is uses for it um, where I would be applying my judgment to choose who is in my sample. Uh, if I was doing interviewing, I might be using my judgment uh, to select my sample for interviewing as well. With quota sampling, uh, we're still non-random and basically we would come up with some particular quotas for characteristics or demographics. So we might decide we want a certain percentage of men and women, or we want a certain percentage of different age groups, or we want a certain percentage of different ethnic groups, or different other different kinds of consumers. Uh, and so normally we would then do some sort of convenience or judgment sampling but we'd be applying this idea of a quota to it so if I was in the shopping mall or wherever I was I wouldn't just be selecting any old person I'd be keeping track of these characteristics to try and uh, make sure that I am getting the right percentages of the different age groups and genders and so on there is a uh, still this strong possibility of bias um, and particularly uh, if I have my quotas wrong I could actually be creating more bias so not necessarily ideal but it may be it may give us a little bit more accuracy uh, or certainly more representativeness across these characteristics than if we just did a straight convenience sample and we just grabbed whoever was handy okay our final non-random non-probability method is snowball sampling so snowball sampling is uh, where we select some initial group of respondents uh, and I've said that they're selected at random they may be at random they may not be at random uh, but basically if you imagine a snowball rolling down a hill and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger it's the same kind of idea where I will find an initial group of respondents um, it could be random or non-random and then I ask them to find more respondents and then those people ask are then asked to find more and then the next group of people are asked to find more so each time someone uh, gets recruited into your sample they get asked if they can recruit more people into your sample uh, so this might seem like an unusual way of going about collecting a sample, but for some, uh, trying to find some particular groups, and particularly very small uh, and unique groups, this can be very useful. Uh, we can't have a lot of faith in the statistical results we get from it, but certainly uh, for qualitative research, for interviewing and focus groups and things like that, uh, it does get used quite a lot. I've seen it in a uh, number of masters and PhD projects where it's been maybe a slightly unusual or a very small uh, group that the researcher is interested in and it's been a good way of finding them. So you can imagine if I wanted to find maybe people who were suffering from a particular disease uh, or had a particular condition or had a particular hobby that was very unusual 
uh, or were maybe some sort of um, minority group in, in some particular way. If I just go out and do random surveying street to street or telephone interviewing or anything like that, it's going to be very hard to find these people if there's no particular list. For some diseases there may be uh, support groups or lists or foundations that you can go to, but for some there might not. But what you tend to find is that if you can find one or two people who have this condition or have this unusual hobby or have this unusual characteristic, quite often they know other people uh, through their own social networks who uh, also fit the same criteria. And so the recruitment ends up being done largely by these people who know other people who fit the criteria that you're looking for. Okay, so that's snowball sampling. Now we're going to move on to our probability based or our random sampling techniques. So our first one is simple random sampling. And so simple random sampling, you can imagine that I have my population um, and then I get my sampling frame. Um, my sampling frame is hopefully some sort of list um, of people or elements that I can choose from and in the very simplest way you can imagine I just number them and I get some random numbers to draw some random people uh, or random elements and that's my sample. So it is very much just take a list and then through some random process, so maybe random numbers, select people off that list and that is my sample. Sometimes this is all you need. It's very, it's for a statistician it's much easier to analyze than the other probability methods uh, and it is quite simple to explain. It can be simple to do sometimes. If I have a list of email addresses and I just randomly pick some of them and email people, it's very nice and easy for me to do. If I had to go and see the people face to face, maybe I was doing medical research, I had to take uh, blood from them, then simple random sampling could might not be very good. If I my population of interest was all the people in Australia, and I some firstly getting a list of all the people in Australia could be tricky. Uh, probably the best I could do would be something like the electoral roll. Uh, and then I selected people and I had to travel all around Australia to find these random people. Uh, it would be very difficult and very expensive. In fact, really it would be impossible to be able to do. So sometimes simple random sampling is uh, just nice and easy, uh, can be administered well. Sometimes though, particularly if we're dealing with uh, like traveling over large geographical areas, it's not so good. Okay, and my next one is systematic sampling. So systematic sampling is a little bit different. It starts from a random starting point in my data, and so it's the random element to it. And then after that, we go through every, and I've said ith, so i is going to be a number. So it might be every fifth or every tenth or every twentieth or hundredth or two hundredth uh, element and select that item or that person. So the way that I work out i is I get my population size and then I divide by my desired sample size. And the random starting point will be somewhere between 1 and i, and then from there I'll just count through. So it might be every 20th or 25th or 50th or whatever i is calculated to be, that's how many I will count through. For some data this is very convenient. You can imagine if I was auditing and I have a whole lot of numbered receipts, sampling every 100th receipt or every 50th financial document, very convenient. If I'm doing quality control, and I'm looking at batches coming through a um, some sort of manufacturing process, then every 20th batch or every 15th box or every 100th item I can perform quality control checks on. So basically if I've got data, I've got some sort of ordered list to sample from, uh, then systematic sampling can be very convenient. It's not going to work for every situation, and I do need to be a little bit careful if I'm counting through every 20th or 50th or 100th, there is a small chance that I could miss some sort of pattern that's occurring in my data just by taking these equal spacings every time. My next probability method is called stratified sampling. So for stratified sampling, I get my population of interest and I divide it into subpopulations. So these subpopulations are called strata. And so the strata are groups that I'm interested in uh, who 
I would like to see represented in my sample. We normally have two different ways that we go about stratified sampling. Uh, one is called proportionate stratified sampling. With proportionate stratified sampling, what we do is we want to ensure that the same proportion of particular groups in my population are represented in my sample. So suppose that my population of interest was 60% female and 40% male, then a proportionate stratified sample, my sample would be 60% female, 40% male. For those of you who have done some valued opinions or other internet surveys by now, you might have noticed that quite often they'll have some screening questions at the front and they will ask you things like your gender and what state you live in, uh, perhaps your education level or your occupation and some other demographic questions. And what they are doing there is they are doing stratified sampling. They will have a particular percentage of these various different groups that they want and once uh, they have enough people in a particular group they won't accept any more. So if you happen to be 30 years old and they already have enough 30 year olds then you'll get a message saying thank you for your interest but we don't need you for the survey. And so that will be because they want people who are falling into the other age groups in order to get the uh, proportions of the different ages that match the population. A slightly more complex version of stratified sampling is disproportionate sampling. We see that in health studies sometimes where there may be particular groups uh, and so two examples in New Zealand would be uh, ensuring that there is adequate representation of uh, Maori and Pacific participants. In Australian health uh, it would be common for us to want to see a uh, good representation of Aboriginal participants in our health study and so if you are particularly interested in those groups and particularly if the group is quite small you might oversample. So instead of trying to stratify proportionately where you have the same proportion in your sample that you do in your population you might oversample those groups that you are very interested in. So it might be that Aboriginal people make up 3% of the population, but you might aim to have them as, say, 10% of your sample to ensure that you're going to have uh, a large enough group to be able to draw conclusions about. Our final random method is called cluster sampling. So again with cluster sampling we're splitting the population up into groups but this time instead of trying to ensure that the groups are all represented we are using the groups as our selection method. So for example if I was interested in surveying school children then a really obvious place where I could find school children would be in schools. So instead of randomly selecting students, I could do a cluster sample where I'm randomly selecting clusters of students by randomly selecting schools. So a cluster sample is particularly useful where we have our elements naturally grouped into groupings. So we might just choose a cluster of um, clusters, a random selection of schools or a rep random selection of hospitals if we're interested in sick people. We can do it geographically as well. So we might have a city broken up into suburbs or streets or census area units and just randomly select some of those and those ones that we select uh, become our sample. Some of you may have realized there could be a downside to this if you did it naively. If I randomly selected schools and just by accident I only selected wealthy schools or public schools or private schools or rural schools or urban schools, I might get some bias in my results. Normally what I would do is if I was cluster sampling is I would do what we call two-stage or multi-stage sampling. So I might do a cluster sample where I'm randomly selecting schools, but I might stratify it. So I'm putting these two methods, stratification and cluster sampling, together. So I'm going to randomly select schools, 
but I'm going to sure, ensure that I have a representative percentage of private schools and public schools, uh, maybe single sex and co-ed, uh, maybe a range of different uh, socioeconomic areas, uh, urban schools and rural schools. So by combining the different sampling methods, I can end up with a uh, hopefully much more accurate and representative sample. So that's two-stage or multi-stage sampling, but just to reiterate, cluster sampling just by itself, we are dividing our sampling units up into these clusters where everyone's uh, kind of grouped, so it could be schools or schools or streets or hospitals or workplaces, wherever we, we can kind of see a natural grouping and then we just randomly select some of those clusters. Okay, so here's a bit of a summary uh, of some of the strengths and weaknesses of our different techniques. Uh, you can see that it's just been pulled out of the book, so you can go and have a look at that and kind of read around it. Again, do bear in mind that these are quite generic strengths and weaknesses. For a particular scenario and a particular example, uh, you may find that some of the advantages and disadvantages are relevant and perhaps some are not. Perhaps there's others, other ones that are specific to a scenario that aren't listed there as well. So you always need to keep that in mind. When you're working with a scenario, don't just regurgitate generic information. Actually think about how a particular sampling method applies to the scenario and the example that you were given. This has been a Swinburne production.